Question 1.1 reads, inertia is the tendency of an object to, and the correct answer here is C, where inertia is the tendency of an object to remain at a state of rest or in a state of uniform motion. We know that inertia is closely linked to the momentum of an object, which basically, in line with Newton's second law, says that a object will remain in its state of uniform motion unless acted upon by a non-zero net force. Now, it's with that in mind that the option D was also accepted in this because it is it can be interpreted to be or to mean inertia as well, but the correct answer was option C. Question 1.2. A person stands on a bathroom scale that is fixed to the floor of a lift as shown in the diagram below. The reading on the scale is largest when the lift moves. Now, it's important to remember that the two things remain constant, or there's one thing that remains constant, and that is the force of gravity that is acting downward on this person or on the scale or on this lift. Because their mass is constant, the force of gravity is always constant. What changes here is the force or the tension force in this cable. So obviously, if the lift needs to accelerate upwards, it would mean that the tension force would have to be greater than the force of gravity. And the tension force in this scenario, in all these lift scenarios, is equivalent to the reading on the scale. So when we are asked when the reading on the scale is going to be largest, we are essentially asking what is the reading, what is the tension force going to be? And in order to make the tension force as large as possible, we need the scale to be accelerating upwards because in order for it to accelerate upwards, that means that the, the net force is greater than zero, which means that the tension force is greater than the force of gravity. So the reading on this scale is going to be largest when this lift moves upward at an increasing speed. Obviously, that just means at an increasing velocity or at an acceleration. Question 1.3 reads, an object is projected vertically upwards, ignore air resistance as the object rises its velocity. So we remember that for this object, which is now a projectile, there is a force of gravity acting downward on it. That is the only force acting on this object. Now, it did start with an initial velocity upwards, which means that it will move upwards, its velocity will be upwards, even though the net force is downward, which means that the acceleration of this object is downward. So it will be moving upwards while accelerating downwards. And that means that the correct answer is option C. The velocity is directed upwards, but its acceleration is directed downwards. Correct answer to 1.3 C. Question 1.4 reads, ball P and ball Q of the same mass are dropped onto a concrete floor. Both balls hit the concrete floor at the same speed, V. Ball P rebounds with the same vertical speed, V, but ball Q rebounds with a speed one half, V. Refer to the diagram, ignore air resistance. Which one of the following statements regarding the collision of each ball with a concrete floor is correct? A, kinetic energy is conserved for both balls, P and Q. We know that that is not true because kinetic energy is one half times the mass of the object times the velocity squared. So since ball Q's velocity has halved, its kinetic energy will certainly not be conserved. Option B, the change in momentum of ball P is greater than that of ball Q. And we can check that by seeing that change in momentum is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the change in the object's velocity, final velocity minus the initial velocity. The mass of both balls is the same, but for ball P, the final velocity is, let's say, negative V, where the initial velocity was positive V, so the change in momentum for this ball was negative 2 MV. Whereas for ball Q, we can calculate the change in momentum. Once again, the mass is constant, but the final velocity is negative 1 half v and the initial velocity was also v but that then tells us that this object's change in momentum was negative 3 over 2 times 
MV, which is clearly less than that of ball P. So the correct answer there is option B. Option C is incorrect. The contact time with the floor is the same for both balls. That's not possible because in order for ball Q to have lost energy, it must have been in contact with the floor for longer. So C is incorrect. And the momentum is conserved. The momentum is not conserved for either of these balls because the velocity changes direction. One point five reads if the network done on a moving object is positive, then we can conclude that the kinetic energy of the object, and then there are a number of options there. And what we're looking at here is the work energy theorem, which says that the network acting on an object is equal to that object's change in kinetic energy. So very simply, if the network done on an object is positive, that means that the kinetic energy of that object must have increased because the network implies that there is a net force. If there's net work done, it means that there's a net force acting on that object. And if there's a net force by Newton's second law, that object will accelerate. And if that object accelerates, its velocity increases. And if its velocity increases, its kinetic energy will increase. So the correct answer to 1.5, that the kinetic energy of the object has increased, that is option B. 1.6 reads, the spectrum produced by a moving asteroid as observed from Earth indicates that the light has shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. Which one of the following frequency combinations of the observed light and the distance between the asteroid and Earth is correct? Now, what's important to remember here is that the visible light spectrum ranges in wavelength and frequency, and that ranges from blue light strictly speaking, that is violet light, all the way to red light at the other end of the spectrum, where blue light has the shortest wavelength. And because wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional, the highest frequency, and all the way to the other end of the spectrum, where red light has the greatest or the longest wavelength, and as a result, the shortest or the lowest frequency. Now, when they say to us that the light from this asteroid has shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, that means that the frequency of this light has increased because the frequency increases towards the blue end of the spectrum. And then finally, we know that this can only happen if the waves are being compressed as they approach the Earth because as they are emitted from the asteroid, the asteroid is continually moving closer to the Earth. And as a result, as that asteroid moves closer to the Earth, the waves then compress on each other. As a result, the frequency appears higher, which then tells us that the asteroid must be moving towards the Earth. A blue shift implies that the two objects are moving towards each other. And the frequency of the observed light has increased because it's been blue shifted. And so our correct answer to 1.6 is option A. This is always going to be true. When light is blue shifted, it means that the two objects are moving closer together. When light is red shifted, it means that the two objects are moving further apart. 1.7 reads, three charged spheres, X, Y, and Z, supported by insulating threads of equal length, hang from a beam as shown in the diagram below. Sphere X is negatively charged. Sphere X attracts Y but repels Z. And from that, we can tell that Y must be positively charged because if it is attracted to X, they must have opposite charges. And so Y is positively charged. And since Z is repelled by X, that means that Z and X have the same charge, which means that Z is negatively charged. Which one of the following conclusions is correct? And the correct answer there is A, sphere Y is positively charged, and sphere Z is then negatively charged. 1.8 reads, in the circuit diagrams below, the cells and resistors are identical. The cells have negligible internal resistances. The power dissipated in resistor X is P. The power dissipated in resistor Y is. We solve this using the formula 
for power dissipated in a device, P is equal to V squared over R. And so in this first device, if we assume that our cell is providing a voltage V, that means that this device here is using a voltage of V over two. So the power dissipated by resistor X is then very simply V squared over R, where as we've said in this device, the voltage is V over two, and that is squared over R. And so we get a power of V squared over four R. We can do the same for our parallel circuit where they've told us that the cell is identical, also providing a voltage V, but because voltage is constant in parallel, that means that resistor Y is also using a voltage V. So the power dissipated in resistor Y is there far simply, far more simply just V squared over R. And then when we compare this V squared over R in resistor Y, to V squared over 4R in resistor X, we can see that the power dissipated in resistor Y is four times that of resistor P. So once again, what we've done is we've assumed that both cells are identical in that they provide the same voltage. The series voltage though is divided and as a result, this resistor only uses V over two volts and so we can calculate the power dissipated by this resistor and compare that to this resistor here, which uses the entire voltage provided by the cell. And then we can see that the power dissipated in resistor Y is four times the power dissipated in resistor X. One point nine reads, which one of the following actions will not cause an increase in the induced EMF in a coil? if the coil is rotated in a uniform magnetic field. We know that the induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux according to Faraday's law. And, and so clearly option A would result in an increased induced EMF because rotating the coil faster changes the magnetic flux faster. The same for option B, increasing the strength of the magnetic field also has an impact on the change in magnetic flux, and so does option C, increasing the number of turns in the coil. Option D is our correct answer because replacing the coil with a coil of lower resistance does not affect the induced EMF in that coil. It will affect the induced current that comes out of that coil because the resistance has an impact on the current that's induced, but the induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of flux and is not related to the resistance of that coil in any way. So the correct answer there is option D. 1.10 reads, a learner writes the following statements about the emission spectrum of light in a notebook. An emission spectrum is formed when a certain frequencies of electromagnetic radiation pass through a cold gas. We can immediately see that that is wrong because that is an absorption spectrum that is formed when certain frequencies pass through a cold gas. The next two, the lines in the emission spectrum of an atom have the same frequency as the corresponding lines in the atom's absorption spectrum. That is correct. An emission spectrum is formed when the atom makes transitions from a high energy state to a low energy state. That is also correct for an emission spectrum. Which one of the following combinations is correct? And as we said here, A is incorrect because that is an absorption spectrum, not an emission spectrum. And so only two and three are correct. And so the correct answer here is option C.